As I said last week, we need to look to and for Jesus in the salvation story. Um, When we look at Genesis, that is ultimately what it is. Like I said before, when we look at the book of Revelation, we think it's end times. When we look at Genesis, we think it's about creation. While those things are true, ultimately Revelation says it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Genesis is no different. It is a revelation of Jesus and showing us how Yeshua is going to become that Savior. It is the promise of how the world got into this mess, our need for a Savior, a promise for that Savior, and then following the seed to bring us that Savior in Yeshua. And so um, it is a very important book, a foundation. We talked about last week how Without Genesis, we have no foundation, no, no context to read any of the books of Kings or Chronicles or the Prophets or Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That you can't get rid of Torah, the first five books even, or even Genesis alone, and have context for the rest of Scripture. Going on that, I just want to continue to show you the importance of a solid foundation. And what we're going to see, maybe some of you heard me talk about why creation is important in the past, and so I'm going to kind of hit some of those ideas. You know, if you build a house and you build it on a solid foundation, that house is going to stand for years and years to come. But if you build that same foundation, or same house, that same structure on a shaky foundation, it's going to collapse doesn't matter how solid it is. Likewise, it doesn't matter about your doctrines or anything like that, what you believe in. If you don't have a foundation for those doctrines, they won't stand. They won't stand up to scrutiny. They won't stand up to criticism. They they won't stand up to be consistent. And so many people are ignorant of the fact that Genesis is the foundation for our Christian doctrines. You might look at it as a keystone as well. If you remove that keystone from this archway, everything is coming down. Everything holds or hinges upon that one stone. And so, Genesis is an interesting word. Bereshit, in the beginning. Really, Genesis means beginnings, origins. That is the definition of the word. Now, the other interesting thing is if you want to know the meaning of something, you go back to its origin, to its beginning, to find out what it means. If I would ask you the word gay, what does that mean? If I asked you that outside of the context of Bible study, most of you would say homosexual. But in context of this, most of you probably say, well, yeah, it means happy. If we want to know what it really means, you look it up in a dictionary. The dictionary tells you the first use of that word, and now you have a definition or an origin of that word. It is no different for our doctrines. So if the meaning of anything is tied up in its origin, and Genesis means origin, the meaning of anything is going to be tied up in Genesis. Just some logic there. The problem is, is we have replaced Genesis as our keystone and we've tried to put in evolution or humanism or liberal theology or any kind of other thing. Maybe a, a, a Genesis that isn't true history, but an allegorical Genesis. And when we do that, our doctrines cannot stand because we are left without a true solid keystone. And we see the results of removing Genesis from our society, from our churches, from our culture, from our families. We see that around us today. Like I said, sometimes we've tried to replace that keystone with evolution. And that doesn't work because the most important doctrines of sin and the gospel are destroyed without Genesis being literal history. As I said last week, yes, there are allegorical uh, aspects to this historical book. No question about it. But you cannot deny its historical truth and accuracy, as we talked about last week. 
Because you see, the very fact that a creator exists literally means something. It means that he made you, he made me, he made all of us, and that means he has the right to set the rules for our life. If we decide to break those rules, then who are we going to be held accountable to? Well, our creator. But if evolution is true and that we are a product of chance by lightning striking primordial suit millions and billions of years ago, now who's going to tell us what to do? Who's the authority and standard for truth? You know, who gets to say what truth is? Well, you do and you do and you do and you do. And as I say, that's a bunch of doo-doo. Because now we have chaos. We have exactly what is going on in our society today. We all get to make up our own rules. We've all become narcissists. We get to decide. God doesn't get to tell us. You know, he created us, that's fine, you know, because we don't take it that seriously. Now, I'm here. So, we'll take it from here. We have man-made rules that govern our society today because there is no creator. We'll get into that a little bit more here in a minute, but as we were talking last week that there are chiasms in Genesis. There are chiasms throughout the Bible all over the place. And when we went through the book of Revelation, we showed you all the connections with the beginning and the end. And how these two fit together so perfectly. There's a division of light and darkness in Genesis 1-4. And there's no darkness in Revelation 21-25. You get rid of the darkness. There's a division of the land and sea in Genesis 1-10. And there's no sea in Revelation 21-1. And by the way, the Jews see the, the deep, the seas, as an abyss and a, a place of evil, ultimately. The sun and moon are created in Genesis 1.16, but they're gone in Revelation. There's no need because Jesus is that light. There's the curse of man in Genesis 3, but that curse is lifted in Revelation 22. There are thorns in uh, Genesis 3.18. No thorns in Revelation 21 verse 4. Uh, the garden is prepared for man in Genesis 2.8 but a city, a perfect city in Revelation 21 too. There's a river of life in the garden, or flowing from the Garden of Eden in chapter 2, verse 10. And there's the throne of God and the tree of life in Revelation 22, 1. There's gold in the garden paradise in Genesis 2, 12. There's gold that, you know, are the streets of gold in Revelation 21, 21. Precious stones in the garden, precious stones in the city. And we see that God walks with man in both of them. We see man eats no meat in either one of them. We see that death begins in Genesis, it ends in Revelation. Evil is there in Genesis, but it's cast away in Revelation. The Savior is promised in Genesis and is fulfilled completely and returns in Revelation. Man is kept from the tree of life in Genesis, but has access again in Revelation. Satan is free to roam in Genesis, but he is bound and destroyed in Revelation. We are covered with coats of skin in Genesis, but covered with coats of glory in white linen, righteous acts of the saints in Revelation. All of these connections are there showing us that Revelation cannot be understood without the foundation of Genesis. Without the origin, without the beginning of all of these things, Revelation loses all of its teeth. There's, there's just no power in it. I want to show you here uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. Maybe some of you have seen Netflix has a, a series now out uh, that deals with Jeffrey Dahmer and his story. Unfortunately, they don't tell the full story of Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm going to give a little hint here tonight. In case you don't know who Jeffrey Dahmer is, he was a famous serial killer, cannibalistic, um, evil man. He killed a number of people. He's uh, Basically, what I'm going to do is, rather than just show you this, I want to show you an interview that he did with Dateline, Stone Phillips, with he and his father, Jeffrey Dahmer and, and Jeffrey Dahmer's father. 
And I want to show you the importance of Genesis as a foundation for the gospel and understanding Christianity as a whole. So watch this, this video here. I feel it's uh, wrong for people who commit crimes to try to shift the blame onto somebody else, onto their parents or onto their, their upbringing or, circ or living circumstances. I, I think that's just a, a cop-out. And uh, my parents, my relatives, had no knowledge of what I was doing. They're absolutely not responsible for any of it in any way. And uh, I take full responsibility. But you, under it, but you understand that what you did would lead your father to ask himself all kinds of questions. That's true. Where, where I did I go that. wrong? Was there something I could have said or done to have prevented this? Right. Did I, in some way, create or contribute to the terrible acts my son committed? I understand that. I, I just get uh, angry with other people who, who think that uh, they have a right to, uh, to somehow try to blame my parents for what happened. That's not right at all. No one has the right to do that because they're totally innocent. They had no knowledge of it. And uh, that angers me. But parents just naturally, I mean, any parent that really cares, they just first of all say, I, gee, I feel guilty. You know, I, there's just feelings of guilt. What happened? What did I do? What could I have done? And so that's a normal parental reaction. Your dad has wondered about all kinds of things, from the medication that your mom was on during her pregnancy, to the fact that you were exposed to violent arguments in the home from an early age and continuing, to the possibility that he might have passed on some genetic propensity for obsession or violent behavior. Does any of that ring true to you? I can see why he'd wonder about those things, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're all excuses because I didn't feel accountable to anybody. I didn't feel that I had to, to uh, face what I had done ever. And uh, so you, you have, there comes a point where a person has to, has to be accountable for what he's done. Can't go, can't go around making excuses, uh, blaming other people or other things. So I, I alone am the one who's responsible for what's happened. Let me ask, when did you first feel that, that everyone is accountable for their actions? Well, thanks to you for, for sending uh, that uh, creation science uh, material. Because I always, I always believe the, uh, the lie that uh, evolution is truth, the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from uh, the slime and uh, when, we, when we died, you know, that was it. There was nothing. So it, the whole theory cheapens life and uh, started reading books about how, that show how evolution is, is just a complete lie. There's, there's, no, there's no basis in science to, to uphold it. And I've come to, since come to believe that uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the true creator of uh, the heavens and the earth. It just didn't just happen. And uh, I have accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And I believe that I, as, long, as well as everyone else, will be accountable to him. Growing up, did you feel that you were accountable to your dad or to your mom as the authority yes, figure I did. in the house? Yes, I did. I mean, they, they didn't let me uh, run wild. They were. They disciplined me, and uh, so I felt accountable to them. But afterwards, after I left the home, that's that's when I uh, started wanting to uh, sort of create my own little world where I could be the one who had the complete control, where I didn't have to uh, bow to anyone else's demands, and uh, I just took it way too far. Lionel. At that period of time, I had drifted away from a belief in a supreme being. And I never, as a result, passed along the feeling that we are all accountable in the end. He owns us. And that basic concept is very fundamental.
to all of us. You feel that the absence, at least for a while, of a strong religious faith and yes. belief for some years may have prevented you from instilling some of that in Jeff. That's right. Is that how you feel? Yes, I think I had a big, uh, big part to deal to do with it. I mean, uh, if you don't, if a person doesn't think that there there is a God to be accountable to, then then what's what's the point of of trying to uh, modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? Uh, that's how I thought anyway, and uh, I've since come to believe that. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is truly God, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're the only true God. That is what creation means. I have seen that countless times as I go and speak in prisons where the same type of understanding of the accountability to one who made them is like a switch that turns on that all of a sudden they realize because Genesis is real, then so is accountability. So is the need of a Savior. And so this is what I mean by Genesis being foundational. I'm in a creation ministry not because I love science, but because I know how important it is as a foundation for the gospel. A foundation for literally every doctrine I believe in. Marriage is founded in Genesis. As I said, the first marriage was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. God set a standard of what it should be. He says the two become one flesh. You see, God's math and our math are a little bit different. Today in our society, we don't have an understanding of what a marriage is, so we think, oh, there's a man, there's a woman, they get married, there's still a man and a woman, they're two individuals, and we're going to treat each you know, as two separate things. We're two different people. Is that what Scripture says? Is that what the standard was in Genesis for a marriage? Not at all. He says the two will become one. Malachi 2.15, it even says, And why did I make them one? Because I was seeking godly offspring. And... Not only is it impossible to have offspring with same-sex marriage outside of adoption, obviously, or things like that, but godly offspring only by the grace of God, not because of the family, not because of their responsibility in doing what they're supposed to be doing. You see, marriage has been torn apart today because we don't understand it from a biblical perspective today. Matthew 19, verses 4 and 5 Jesus was questioned about divorce. Is it okay to get a divorce? And Jesus' answer was taking them back to a literal historical event, saying, have you not read that he which made them millions of years after the beginning? No. At the beginning. He defines when the beginning is, so you don't need to wonder when it is, if the scientists have it figured out or not. Jesus told us that it was when he made Adam and Eve, that's the beginning. And he says, haven't you read, like, duh, that at the beginning God made them male and female, not male and male and male and, and female and female. Defining it right here. He says, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. Today, Kids, adults, they go sleeping around thinking it doesn't matter. It's just, yeah, I lost my virginity. I lost that a while back. It doesn't matter anymore. No, every time you're sleeping with somebody, you have become one with them. Now, I don't understand how all of that works, but I know what Scripture says and I believe it to be true. And there's a piece of you that is now missing because you have given a piece of you to somebody else. Our kids need to know the origin of a marriage. We got to just not stop, you know, just stop talking about only abstinence. But they need to know what's happening in sexual unity. 1 Corinthians 6 talks about this and it says that do you not know that if you unite yourself with a prostitute you become one with her? You go and sleep around and you're sleeping with some ungodly person, you've just become one. Maybe with a demon-possessed person. But see, we don't talk about 
these things in a marriage. We don't talk about them being real. We just see two people getting married, becoming two people, and then when they get a divorce, it's okay. They go off as two different separate people again. No harm. No loss. But no, God says, why did he says, I hate divorce. Why? He says, what God has joined together, let not man tear apart. What does that mean then? When you if you're one and you get a divorce, what do you become? A half? I don't know. I'm not saying that there isn't forgiveness. I'm not saying that God even didn't, you know, He did give some reasons, acceptable reasons to get a divorce, but He says, I hate it. This is not what was intended. This is not the definition, the standard that was set in Genesis. The holiness. We see the roles of a marriage falling apart today because we don't take Genesis seriously. We don't take the Word seriously. Every single one of these verses gives the responsibility and role of a woman. Every single one of these say that a role of a woman is to be submissive to her husband. Oftentimes I need to hide after I talk about that. Now, I don't think we need to talk too much in this group about what submissiveness means, but I do want to touch on it. Okay, This is not a matter of equality. It's a matter of roles. You've heard me say before, what's better, a horse or a cow? I don't know. It depends on if you want milk for the cereal, you'd better take the cow. If you want to ride into town, the horse is a better choice. You see, just because a man and a woman have different roles doesn't mean one is better than the other, but let me tell you, they have different roles. And today in our society, we are being told that a man can do whatever a woman can do and a woman can do whatever a man can do. That's a bunch of horse pucky right there. A woman will never be able to do what a man can do. And I'll tell you what, a man cannot do what a woman can do. Not even close. I've seen Mr. Moms out there. Doesn't work, folks. There is something that God has placed in us to need a mother to... I can't put it into words. I don't know how old I was when my mom died. 40-something. And there was something that I still... just It's like, to this day, I feel like calling her when I'm driving down the road at times. There are things that a mother feels and thinks and I, I'm still trying to figure out how my wife thinks. I, 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 my brain can't do it. And men will get to you in a moment, but for now, men need to be respected. You know the Bible talks about men and women and it says over and over and over a woman is to submit to her husband. Do you know there is only, I think once, if not any, but I think there's one verse that mentions love for a woman to love her husband. Why? Because women don't need to be reminded to love. It comes pretty natural to a woman. Men, I'm still trying to figure it out. Men don't understand love like a woman does. I'll tell you what, when I got hurt, I wasn't running to my dad. It was always mom. There are so many things that the Bible says about women, but most of all, it is being submissive. And that's because it's what you are terrible at. And even this is going to be found in Genesis in the curse. We'll talk about it when we get there, but for now, because of the importance of the context here, what is the curse of the woman? We all remember, oh yeah, pain in childbearing. That's the one that everybody talks about. But it says, and your desire will be for your husband. And when I first read that, I thought, thank you, Jesus. 
She's going to want me. I mean, who wouldn't? You know? No. What kind of curse is that? Your desire is going to be for your husband? That's no curse. The key is in the Hebrew word for. Your desire will be for. That Hebrew word is tzolka. Like I said, we'll look at it later. But the bottom line is it means to control. Your desire, women, is to control your husbands. And you do it. Whether you even realize it or not, you try to manipulate. And you've heard me talk in Genesis before about how you have the heart of the man. And you know that. And because of that, you manipulate with your emotions. You manipulate with your tears. And this is part of what God's Word says is part of the curse you are going to want to control your husband. You are not going to want him to rule. You're not going to want to have him have the authority to be able to tell you no, to be able to you know, have permission to do things or that or whatever. We could go on and on. But only you know what's in your heart. But the bottom line is the Bible says that that has been given to you as a gift from Satan from the beginning. On the flip side, there's the men. Fathers to the children shall make known thy truth. Fathers, bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers are to be the spiritual head of a house. Many men don't want to be the spiritual head. They'd rather, it's easier for the woman to do it. It's moms that are making sure that dad's out of bed to go to church. It's moms that are making sure that the kids are dressed and ready to go to church. It's moms that are making sure that sometimes dad even gets there rather than going fishing, hunting, or whatever his hobby might be. You see, fathers have neglected their spiritual role as well. They have found it so much easier to let the woman have control in those things. It's the mothers that are making sure that the children are being trained in the Word of God. But fathers, it says, this is your responsibility to take the spiritual headship to to lead your family. Not just your wife, but your children as well. Last week in After Hours, we were talking about, we kind of had a good marital counseling session with everybody. And that's one of the things I brought up, though, is, you know, as a man, it is very hard because as a spiritual head, we, we've grown up in a society that now is telling us happy life, happy wife, happy life. Again, garbage. If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Garbage. I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to make our wives happy. Yes, we should. However... We are now in a society that is saying that women should have everything that they want. And so the man's job is just to make them happy. Is that how you'd raise your children? Give them everything they want? How would it turn out if you did? And like children, if they don't get what they want, they kick and scream. So... Do you suspect that maybe women, sometimes if you don't get what you want, you might try and kick and scream? So fathers, we have a role to lead spiritually. Women, I'm not saying it's easy to be submissive. I imagine it is extremely difficult. But I want you to understand that we also have to be submissive as men. Not to you but to our Father. And sometimes that means making hard choices. It means doing hard things. It is hard to be a spiritual leader. I have failed miserably many times and in many ways in being a spiritual leader and and know that I will continue probably. And that's why, women, we need your prayers. You were created as one of your roles, your primary role, to be a help meet to us because we need you. We're kind of slow. 
And we need your prayers. We need you to encourage us, to lift us up, to, to give us the respect to, to do those things because on our own, we don't do it well. And we need that. You know, we're told in the Word in Ephesians, Fathers, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. I think that husbands, we need to, to really take that to heart because what did Christ come to do? He's, he's the model of what we're supposed to be. So did He come and say, hey, I want dinner at six, rub my feet, do this, do that. Hey, how come the floors aren't clean? No, is, is that how Jesus loved the church? No, he said, and gave himself up for her. So I guess, fathers, what that means is that we don't just have a role of being a spiritual leader, but we have a role of loving our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That means we should be willing to not only die, but to be self-sacrificing to our wives and for our wives. Adam, I think, you know, if that's the correct inter interpretation as we'll you know, talk about when we get there, I think that's the model of it. We are to, to love our wives as Christ did. You know what Christ came to do? Serve us, didn't he? He said he came to serve. So husbands... I guess then if we're going to follow the role God has ordained for us in a marriage, we're going to serve our wives. That doesn't mean giving them everything they want. But it also doesn't mean that we expect to be served all the time either. You know, I'm convinced that if men would love their wives like that, women wouldn't have a problem being submissive. And I'm convinced that if women would be submissive, husbands wouldn't have as much of a hard time loving their wives. I think if we were both submissive to the roles that God has ordained for us in a marriage, those marriages would work. But we don't. We both stink at it. And that is why we need the Word of God in our marriage. You can't expect to just live your life and then think you have the power and the strength within yourself to make it in a marriage. You don't. This is why you need to have family prayer. You need to have family devotions. You need to be coming to Bible studies. You need to be worshiping together. You need to be doing these things together because that is where the power is at. I think that so often that we, have, we think that we have the power to do this. Oh, we've, we've got to have more date. We've got to have date night. Hey, that's fine. That's good. But let me tell you something. That's only a band-aid. That's not going to make a good marriage. It's a start. But it's not the end. It's not going to make a good marriage. Uh, you might hear, oh, well, we've got to communicate better. Well, that's good. But that's not going to solve the problem. Those are simply band-aids. The cure is the power of God in our marriage. And that comes from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit working in our lives and in our marriages. And if we are not doing that, we need to start. Praying together, worshiping together, studying together. And men, you're the spiritual leader. That means this is on you. And if... Well, I'll leave it there. <coughs> I think you get the point, but these are all things that are laid right here in Genesis as a standard of a marriage, a role of a marriage, and we've abandoned them all. They say over 50%, I've seen up to 70% of marriages end up in divorce today. But that same statistic I saw somewhere here a few years back that if you have people, couples that go to church together, pray together, worship together, do all these things that I've been saying, that it's like one in three or four hundred get divorced. Makes a difference if you follow the rules of the one who instituted the rules for a marriage that those marriages will work. 
Now I realize it takes two to tango, and it, you can't blame, you know, one person all the time or both person all the time. Sometimes it, there's all kinds of different circumstances out there. But I'm telling you, this is what the Word of God says. How about clothing? Why do we wear clothes? Well, I mean, it's, you've got the thing set at 68 degrees. Right? Yes. Well, if that's why we wear clothing, then I am not going to be preaching here in July. If it gets hot in here. If temperature is why we wear clothes, I'm going to do you a favor. I won't be here. Why do we wear clothes? Well, you know, it just so happens that the standard of the beginning, the origin of clothing is found in Genesis. When Adam and Eve sinned, they became aware of their nakedness. And so God had to take an animal and kill it to give them a covering of their sinfulness. Clothing has been given to us because of sin. Boy, don't you think that maybe would be a good thing to teach our kids? Because today, frankly, many, even wives, I don't think understand that. We think clothing has been given to us so that we can be fashionable. And we wear clothes that don't frame our face, but frame our body. You know, Matthew Henry, a very popular Bible commentator, said this, men sin, but devils tempt to sin. I'm not saying this relieves the male of his responsibility to keep his eyes from wandering, but nor does it relieve the female of her responsibility of covering her body and dressing decently. The New Testament even confirms this, and he says that I want women to dress decently with modesty and propriety, not with braided hair, gold, pearls, expensive clothes, but rather with the beauty on the inside, he says in Timothy. That of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. Today, the disgusting bridezillas on TV or the Kardashian, whoever they are, all of these people, the, the pastors of New Orleans or pastors' wives or whatever those shows are called that you see advertised, awful. A disgusting display of what a woman is supposed to be. It's a ring in a pig's snout. We have allowed culture to determine what the meaning of clothing is. Folks, it is not fashion. It is not fashion. It is for a covering. And that should be the number one thing you look at when you go and buy some clothing. Leaders of the household, men... What are you thinking when you let your daughters wear some of the things they wear? Shame on you. You see, there's a standard, a meaning of clothing, and it's given to us in Genesis, and it is because of sin, period. Now, I'm not saying you can't look nice. I'm not, don't let that pendulum go over here. What I'm saying is, the pendulum is over here right now. Clothing is important. I can't say it for sure, but you've probably heard this by now. I believe that one of the animals that God probably killed to cover Adam and Eve's sinfulness, their body was probably a lamb or a goat. To foreshadow the Lamb of God 4,000 years later that was going to shed His blood to cover our sins today. I can just see Adam and Eve standing there looking over there never having seen death in their life. This lamb that was so cute and precious and now it's a bloody carcass and they're wearing its skin saying, we did this. This is, that's why I wear this. I think that that is a picture right there in Genesis of what God would do for us. I mean, 
We can go on and on. The bottom line, though, is that if God created us, he sets the rules for our life. If we are a product of chance and lightning bright striking primordial soup millions and billions of years ago, goo turned into zoo, which then turned into you, now we make up our own rules. That is the difference of Genesis as a foundation in our society or Genesis not as a foundation in our society. The problem is is that we have no longer creation as our foundation, as our, our keystone. If creation was, then we have clothing that we have a standard of what we're supposed to wear. We have marriage that's been given to us because of a blessing of God and there are roles that should be followed. And guess what? Those marriages are going to work. You're going to have laws that are not just mere opinions, and so there will be no homosexuality and things like that going on because you have a standard of what marriage is supposed to be. You're going to have life that has meaning, a sanctity of life. There won't be abortion. But if evolution is your keystone, well then, I guess laws are mere opinions, so do what you want. Just, you know, don't bother me with it, as if it doesn't. You're going to have homosexuality as a legitimate option for marriage. I mean, really, if creation isn't true, then it is an acceptable alternative. Pornography? Go for it. What's the difference? Abortion? You're just an animal anyway. Why not? Some people think, oh, you can't say abortion in Genesis. I mean, you, you, that's a stretch. Is it really? I've, I've told you before that I have met women who have shared with me who went through with an abortion because their doctor said that it wasn't a human being yet. It was just an amphibian in that stage of development. It's just a fetus, not a child. I had one woman share with me how her daughter or son, I don't remember which, uh, when they went to a doctor, they had a birthmark and the doctor said it's where her gills had not healed up all the way because they have what are called gill slits in the womb. A very improper name. They are not gills. They are not slits. They are wrinkles that turn into the jaw, the gland, and the ear. They have nothing to do with breathing at all. But because of these things, there's no value in life. They, they kill their babies. Today, we have made abortion and, and killing, murdering babies... The logical arguments we use, or I should say illogical arguments we use to support murdering children is detestable and an abomination in God's sight. We hear people saying things like, oh, well, I'm against abortion, but, you know, this family, they've already got 12 kids, and, I mean, look at the job they're doing. It's a terrible job of parenting already. They can't afford it. I mean, look, they're running around like ragamuffins. They, they, they don't have enough food. I mean, man, they come over to my house and they just chow everything down. and It's like, you know, I'm against abortion, but I'll tell you, I just don't think this, this family should have that many kids. They'd be better off not being in that family. So you mean that the condition they're born in determines the sanctity of life? I mean, think of the logic of that. You, you can't afford kids, can't afford that many. What happens when your high schooler comes home and says, Mom, Dad, I'm broke, I don't have a job, I need money. He's, well, I don't have any more either, but I want to go to the movie. Sorry, kid. <laughs> can't afford you anymore. I mean, it would be the merciful thing to do, right? I mean, you can't go to the movies. Yeah. Same logic, though. How about location? Oh, it's... it's it's a baby when it's outside of the womb, but when it's inside of the womb, even moments before it's born, it's not a baby because of location. You better be careful about what side of bed you, you wake up on or what side of the road you walk down on if that's what determines the sanctity of life. It's not even location. You talk to one mother who wants the child, it's a baby. You talk to the other mother, it's, it's opinion. Is what it is. That's right. Is it a baby? What is it is the question that is always asked. What is that? They keep calling it a fetus. We call it a child. Okay? It is a child. I mean, if your neighbor kid comes home and says, hey, you know, comes into your house and says, hey, can I kill this? What are you going to ask him? What is it? What, a spider? Yeah, step on it. A mouse? Yeah, kill the thing. Okay? The neighbor kid? No! <laughs> it's kind of important to know what you're killing. 
And that's why they don't like ultrasounds. They don't like those things because they don't want you to know that that's a child. And so they change all these, the verbiage of a fetus or pro-life versus pro-choice. So if it's somebody that wants their baby, they're not going to say, oh, when is your fetus due? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go. When's your fetus due? Okay. It isn't a matter of pro-life and pro-choice. They make it sound so nice. It's pro-death and pro-life. Because God says that there is a meaning in it. Uh, again, the purpose of a marriage, to have godly offspring. It's life. Psalm 51.5, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. From the moment of conception, God knew you were in need of a Savior. Now, I don't know if this is true or not. I haven't been able to confirm it, but my wife showed me something the other day that they, they show that when sperm meets the egg at the moment that happens there's a light that goes off like light I, I, I think it's true I just can't you know I'm not going to stake my life on it right now the moment of conception scripture says you are living so no these are not gill slits they're just wrinkles and I've seen a, a lot of guys with a lot of wrinkles and they can't breathe out of any of them but the top two just because there's similarities doesn't mean it has the same function or it is the same thing. But you think it's a stretch to tie evolution into abortion? Let me show you what they say. This is what, when I was uh, in Latimer, Iowa, there were 27,000 students at Iowa State University being taught this. During development, the fertilized egg progresses over 38 weeks through what is in fact a rapid passage through evolutionary history. From a single primordial cell, the conceptus progresses through being something of a protozoan, a fish, a reptile, a bird, a primate, and ultimately, woohoo, it's a human being. Now, by the way, this is absolutely, even back then, scientifically proven wrong. But this is what they were being taught. You see, the more that God as creator is removed from our society, the more we see morality falling apart the more we see Christian absolutes falling apart we have these evolutionary termites eating away at our foundation getting rid of our keystone no wonder we have Christian schools using public school books to educate their children you act as if it does it's, it's more common than not that they use public secular textbooks in Christian schools or we have Christian politicians claiming to be Christians, yet ruling the things, you know, making rulings on the things that they do. Because we have a, we've added God to a secular philosophy, a secular foundation, one without Genesis as its foundation. You get rid of Genesis as your foundation, this is what you get. You may have seen this before. The Institute for Creation Research, when I first got into this, this was their kind of main illustration of creation and evolution, and I think it is so true. You've got the site of evolution, their castle. They're shooting down at our foundation of Genesis because they know if that keystone, that foundation falls apart, everything comes down. In the meantime, we as Christians, we're fighting the issues. Oh, down with homosexuality, down with pornography, bad abortion, you know, all of these things. And I'm not saying don't fight against those. I, I think you should. But we need to fight as well as at the foundational issue. Because bottom line, let's get abortion to become illegal. What's going to happen five years down the road? A new politician comes in. They just change the rules right back. We're right back where we started. If we don't change the heart of man... Changing the laws doesn't do anything. It's almost like you should have a ministry for this. Yeah, almost. <laughs> the other thing is, notice that we're fighting at, amongst each other. We can't get along. Part of the reason, by the way, is because we don't have the foundation of creation. And so, without that, without taking the Bible as literal historical truth, we, we can't agree with what the Bible says. 
Now, I'm not saying that there wouldn't always be some differences, but not like it is today. You know, it used to be that you could go to a, a, a Lutheran church anywhere in the country, and I would know what they believed. You could go to a Baptist church, and I would know what they believed. You could go to a Methodist church, and I would know what they believed. And you know what? It wasn't all terrible like it is today almost. But today, we make up our own rules. We interpret Scripture the way we want. Scripture doesn't interpret Scripture. I interpret Scripture. Culture, society interprets Scripture. Most important doctrine of all, and you guys know this, but I need to share it anyway, is that Genesis, the origin of the Gospel, is found in Genesis. If you get rid of that keystone of Genesis, then the doctrine of original sin, why death, disease, and suffering are in this world, they all fall apart. Jesus says in Matthew or in Hebrews 9.22, the Word of God says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Without death, there can be no forgiveness. But yet, Evolution tells us death is a hero of evolution. Death is not a bad thing. It's not a curse of sin. It's just natural. It's what brings goo to zoo to you. Guys, if you allow millions of years into your theology, logically what you are allowing is death to be in a world before man was here. That means death did not come because of man's sin. Death is not the wages of sin. Death is not a curse of sin. It is natural. The dinosaurs, the fossil record that was all here before man was on earth. Death is not what the Bible says it is. And if that's the case, and death is not what Scripture says it is, it's just natural, then Jesus' death would also be natural. It has no supernatural power. Jesus' death on the cross cannot take away sins. He could have stayed up in heaven and pronounced forgiveness from his throne. Saved himself a lot of trouble. But no, he came to do that just as an example for us so that you would know how you're supposed to live your life for others. Be willing to die for them. That's what they say. But the very fact that the earth is young, that Genesis' literal history tells me that death is the curse of sin and that's why Jesus came to die, to take the curse upon himself so that we might live. Thorns. You know, we find thorns 410 million years old in the fossil record. How can that be? That's long before humans in their theories. The Bible says thorns are a result of the curse. Evidence of the curse. So you can't have the curse without man, without man sinning. Then you got these liberal theologians out there saying, oh, that's Brian, you're, you're misunderstanding death here. You see, it wasn't... It wasn't physical death that happened in the Garden of Eden. God said to Adam, you know, they eat of the tree, you're going to die. He lives to be 930 years old. See, it was only spiritual death in the Garden of Eden. Oh, really? Dust you are, dust you shall return sounds pretty physical to me. And frankly, that's why Adam only lived 930 years. And when we get to that in Genesis, you're going to understand that it says, dying you shall die. It doesn't say the moment you eat of it you're going to die, but it says the process of death begins. You cut a tree off of the tree or a branch off of the tree, lay it on the sidewalk, within minutes it's going to wither. You see the death process begins. But let's run with this heresy for a moment that it was just spiritual death in the Garden of Eden. Anytime you twist something in Genesis and the very foundation, it's going to affect something on the structure you build upon it. So now you go to the New Testament and we see Jesus talking about this and Paul talking about this. He says that by one man death entered into the world. 
Let's run with the heresy, spiritual death. By one man, Adam, spiritual death came into the world. So also by one man, Jesus Christ, comes the resurrection of the dead. What kind of resurrection? Spiritual. You see, we see a historical connection to a literal Genesis saying that there was a literal death that is going to, a physical death that's going to bring a physical resurrection. So, if it was only spiritual, then there's only a spiritual resurrection. That's what the Sadducees believe. As you know, that's why they were so sad, you see. They did not believe in the physical resurrection of the dead. So, you can't twist something in Genesis without affecting the structure you build on it. You want the Bible to be consistent, then you can't touch it. Evolutionists and atheists understand this far better than most Christians. Richard Bozarth said this a long time ago. He's been saying this for years and the Christians still haven't been able to figure it out. Christianity has fought, still fights, and will fight science to the desperate end over evolution. Why? Because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason that Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. If you destroy Adam and Eve in the original sin, in the rubble, you're going to find the sorry remains of the Son of God. Take away the meaning of His death. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. See, this is why you can't believe in evolution in any way, shape, or form let alone the fact science doesn't even support it. But it still goes on today. No Adam and Eve means no need for a Savior. It also means that the Bible cannot be trusted as a source of unambiguous liberal truth. It is completely unreliable because it all begins with a myth. Builds on that as a basis. No fall of man means no need for atonement. No need for a Redeemer. The sorry remains of the Son of God. Look at this guy here. The most devastating thing, though, that biology did to Christianity was the discovery of biological evolution. By the way, he's an atheist here. <coughs> now that we know that Adam and Eve never were real people, the central myth of Christianity is destroyed. If there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was original sin. If there was never original sin, there's no need of salvation. If there's no need of salvation, there's no need of a Savior. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. I think that evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. I couldn't agree more. It is. And yet somehow we have Christians that defend evolution. Jesus was basically tortured and executed for a symbolic sin by a non-existent individual. You see the difference? One says that death and disease brought man into existence. The other says it was man's existence that brought death and disease. No wonder there are so many angry people with God. When we would witness outside of PJs, I remember a guy coming up to me or a gal, I don't remember which, but I remember them saying, you know, I don't believe in God. He's not a loving God. How could a loving God... Where was he when my best friend was, was dying of cancer? Or where was he when my stepdad was beating me blow after blow? I called out to him. He never answered. You see, we, have, we live in a world of people who have no answer to why there's death, disease, and suffering in this world. I hear it all the time. Or why a, a God could judge the, the, the ungodly people in the book of Joshua. All the killing. That, that, that's not, they don't understand justice. You see, they don't understand sin. So no wonder they're so confused about a loving God. I mean, if you get rid of a literal Adam and Eve that bringing sin into the world that brought death, disease, and suffering, who is to blame for your mom, dad, friends dying of cancer? Well, and God would be. 
But if Adam and Eve are real and we know that this is why death, disease, and suffering came, I've got an answer for those people. But in a society that doesn't accept Genesis as literal truth, they don't believe your answer. Boy, Satan was sly. Yeah, like I said, thorns. It's backwards. You, you gotta make it you, you gotta choose this day whom you're gonna follow. Okay, bottom line, you get rid of Genesis as a foundation. I am telling you, you've got to get rid of all of your Christian doctrines, or at least you have no ground to stand on, especially on the gospel of Jesus and that he died for our sins. So that is why Genesis is going to be so important and why it's important for you to be able to give answers to the people that you're going to meet in churches, let alone the atheists out on the street. Because it is a foundation for literally all of Christianity. It is the foundation to understand all of the Scriptures. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank You for just a foundation that we can trust. That we need not waver in unbelief. We need not waver. But as You tell us that since the creation of the world, your invisible qualities, your divine power, your nature have all been clearly seen and being understood from that which you have been made so that we are without excuse to deny your existence. Lord, just as we go through this study and we dive into your word, may you give us not only a memory but an understanding and a firmness in our faith. Let us not compromise in any way let us not be lied to by the culture and society whether it be about genesis and the science and that or even about the doctrines that are found there with marriage and clothing and life and so many other things so lead us teach us empower us and use us in jesus name we pray amen